Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah. And so uh, before we begin our study this morning, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Lord, we are so very thankful for this time that we have to come and worship you this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to give us clarity of thought and remove the distractions that may be within our hearts and minds as we have come here this morning to learn more about you, to worship you. We pray that you'd help us to learn those things that you have for us. Uh, give me the words to speak, Father, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In Genesis chapter number 10 is where we are this morning, and uh, we finished up Genesis chapter number 9 for the most part, almost uh, this last week as Noah and his sons and all those creatures came off of the ark, and we looked at the rainbow and uh, the uh, details that are found within that rainbow. Anybody see a rainbow this last week since last Sunday? Anybody? No? So uh, there will be one coming, I'm sure, um, as we get into wintertime here. But keep in mind, praise God when you see that rainbow. Thank Him for His covenant that He's made with His creation that He's never going to flood the earth. And that brings us to Genesis chapter number 10 this morning. And I'm going to begin reading here in verse number 1 of Genesis chapter number 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. Now, as we consider looking at the uh, generations of Noah here and the, his sons and their offspring, remember the Lord has allowed us to see very clearly the genealogy that leads from Adam all the way to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so as we take a peek here at uh, our uh, different charts, if you will, um, this one here that has the green writing at the top, this one actually is the uh, genealogy from Noah all the way down to the 12 patriarchs, the children of Israel. And you can see there is some red writing starting in the very top with Noah in the upper left-hand corner. His name is written in red. And you'll see other names that are written in red following down to the right. And then uh, down towards the bottom right of the page is where you're going to see the 12 patriarchs, the 12 children of Israel. And those are in red as well. And this is that bloodline in red um, that leads to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I know this sheet that has the genealogy from Noah down to the 12 patriarchs. Boy, you may need to get out your reading glasses to take a look at that. There's a lot of names there. Um, I would encourage you to do this. Get your Bible out. Turn to Genesis chapter number 10 when you get home. And this week, make this a part of study and read through what it says in the Bible and take a look on here and make sure that it matches up and preacher's not giving you something crazy, right? Um, but you can see how this matches up. And this is always, for me, when I'm considering genealogies of the Bible, God puts them in here for a very specific reason. And therefore, I think we need to pay attention to them. And when it's written out on a chart like I've given you today, for my puny little brain, this makes it a little easier for me to kind of understand uh, what's happening instead of reading name after name after name um, from God's Word and trying to sort it out in my mind. And so let's take a look here, verse number 2. And you can take a look as uh, we consider the uh, bloodlines here. You can refer to your chart. Verse number 2 of Genesis chapter number 10. The sons of Japheth. Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javon and uh, Tubal um, and uh, Meshesh and Tyrus. These are all uh, sons of Japheth here. And now Shem, Ham, and Japheth, those are the three sons of Noah. Don't forget that, okay? Uh, verse number three, and the sons of Gomer, um, Asher, Ashkenaz, um, Ripheth, and uh, Togama. Um, and we can read through all these. And you know what? I don't want to give you a potato for potato. And, and trying to get you all confused on my mispronunciation of so many of these names as we look through the genealogy here. But the clear uh, thing that we need to understand is God has a very specific bloodline that He has uh, demonstrated for us that leads all the way to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Uh, Verse number 5 of Genesis chapter number 10 says this, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. And then the Bible will go on starting in verse number 6 to list those sons of Ham, and we'll be able to uh, see that in the bottom portion of that handout that I gave to you, the generations of Ham uh, that are listed there. But we need to remember that this is the time when God had flooded this earth and all of creation had died with the exception of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the four wives of his three sons and himself. You guys with me? All the rest of the human beings have perished from upon the earth. All the rest of the creatures that God had created um, have all perished other than those that were on the uh, ark with Noah. And so when we consider this, the whole entire earth was now populated from these four men and their wives, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the whole world. And I don't know if you've ever uh, thought very much as far as, well, you know, I wonder where all the different nations and people groups and whatnot actually came from. Um, The Bible gives us a a pretty clear account of where these folks uh, migrated to and where they lived. Um, The Bible gives us an account and it gives us the, the names as well. Um, Noah, uh, as the uh, ark landed there on Mount Ariad and he made his way, Um, we uh, look at the biblical account of Noah and his family uh, migrating over to that area of landmass that we know as China. Um, And we consider uh, that great area of land that's there. We look at Shem, and uh, Shem was uh, uh, one that moved and went over into this area of Asia where we see the Middle East and all these things that are going on right now in Asia Minor. Um, Japheth um, was there um, in uh, Europe and, and Asia, Asia Minor as well. Um, and Ham was over in that area of what we would consider Africa over in that lower part. Now, the son uh, Shem, those are the uh, folks that God's bloodline came through. And the people groups that came from him um, in biblical times were the Hebrews, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, the Persians, and the Syrians. These are the different groups of people that came from uh, this one named Shem. As we look at Ham, Ham was the father of the Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Philistines, the Hittites, and the Amorites. And Ham's descendants settled in the land of Canaan. They were there in Egypt, and they also went down south into Africa. And then we uh, take a look at Japheth, and Japheth, his offspring, were the Greeks, uh, the Thracians, and the Scythians. And they were up in that Europe area and even down into Asia Minor. And we consider where these groups of people went to on this planet, and that's where everybody on our planet has come from. You with me? Um, through the offspring of these that were born um, here from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. After all, where else are they going to come from, right? Where are we going to come from? These are the only humans living on the earth at this time, aren't they? Now, on our other sheet that I've given you here that has the orange uh, writing up at top. This is a little less complex than the first sheet that I gave you, but it'll give you a good idea um, of uh, the biblical record here. And you'll see the writing that's in red. There's a little uh, box that's over in your right-hand corner there. The stuff that's in red is Bible. Okay, so the names that are here and the genealogy that's listed there, we consider Shem, remembering the lineage of Jesus Christ came through Shem. Um, But there's also some other information that's on here. There's some stuff that's written in black. Um, Those are things that uh, we can look at history and understand what's going on as we use the biblical account. Um, But these names that are written in red, these come exactly from the Bible. And this is the bloodline of the three sons of Noah. It's amazing to consider that God had allowed the whole entire earth to be replenished from these four families. Pretty amazing, even to consider today that we have some 8 billion people upon the face of the earth. 
And uh, all these folks came from Adam and Eve originally. Amen? You know, we have in our society today these uh, uh, different groups out there that if you'll allow your blood to be drawn and send it off, boy, they're going to be able to tell you where you came from and what your descendants are. And they're able to look within the blood and understand what parts of the world. Has anybody ever done that here? Anybody? Brother, back there? Where you, where's your bloodline from, brother? What did it say? 75% what? English. Okay? <clears throat> and so... We can look at those things, and the bottom line is we all came from Adam and Eve, didn't we? And uh, after the flood, um, as uh, Adam and Eve produced those people that uh, uh, had offspring uh, uh, named Noah, uh, and Noah, his sons, of course, the whole rest of the world was populated by these families here. Now, if we were to uh, have our blood drawn and let them try and figure all that stuff out, honestly, I don't know all the details on how they come to those conclusions, but I know this, we all came um, from these bloodlines that are represented here. That's where we came from. There's nowhere else um, for us to come from. Let's look back here at uh, verse number 7 of Genesis chapter number 10. Um, and the, or I'm sorry, verse number 6. And the sons of Ham. Um, he had four boys here. Um, let's see here. Uh, Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan. Um, and then the sons of Cush, Sheba, Havilah, um, Sabta, uh, Ramah, Septica. And the sons of Ramah are Sheba and Dudan. Uh, and, you know, anybody here ever name their kids after one of these biblical names? Nobody? These would be a little hard to difficult, a little, a little hard to pronounce. Amen. We have some biblical names in our family, but not any of these, these Old Testament names. I couldn't imagine naming um, one of my kids Nahor or Sarug or, or something like that. That's a little bit different culturally speaking. Um, but you know what? God was uh, good and, and the names that were created here, and they're just a, a little bit different than us. Um, verse number eight, and Cush begat Nimrod. We've heard that name Nimrod before, haven't we? And uh, we're going to be able to see as we go into the next chapter, into chapter number 11, the significance that I believe that Nimrod played um, in this world back in his day. But verse 8 said, Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. I believe that Nimrod was one of these ones that was uh, a type A personality. He was a leader. I believe he uh, was able to use his words in a way that he could uh, persuade people and uh, get people to try and uh, take his side. The Bible says he was a mighty one. He was one that led uh, people back in this time. Verse number 9 goes on to say he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. This man had a skill set um, uh, like none other at this time. He was a mighty hunter. And I, you know, I'm not sure if you guys have ever been into a hunting lodge before. It could be a little intimidating if you've ever uh, been into one of these and you've never seen one before. Um, but you go in there and they typically will have a bunch of trophies of the animals that had been uh, hunted and, and eaten previously. And uh, some of these animals are pretty huge. And uh, I remember a good friend of mine, he's pastoring up in uh, Montana right now. He showed me how to hunt with a bow and arrow when we lived in Washington. And I couldn't believe how big the animal called elk grew to be. They're massive. They're as big as horses. And uh, you had to get pretty close to those things with a, with, to hit them with a bow and arrow. And I remember being very intimidated by the size of these animals and thinking, man, if I don't, if I don't get this thing, he's going to come after me. And uh, I'm going to have no place to go. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And then uh, uh, my, my friend moved to Montana. And we went to visit him in Montana. And I remember when we uh, got out of the church service there, his, his church, we, we drove to his home. And and we're getting ready to pull up in the front yard. And he lives in a little, little town called Plains, Montana. They're up in the mountains. And uh, we're, we're rolling up to his front yard. And there's huge animals everywhere, wildlife. And these very same elk that I told you that I was intimidated by in the state of Washington uh, were residing in his front yard of his house as we drove up. And I remember saying, brother, is it hunting season? Look how big these animals are. Let's get some. Let's eat. And you know what he said to me? 
Now, those are little here in Montana. We don't even shoot them. That's why they're wandering around in town. And uh, the, the animals were much, much bigger there in Montana than they were in Washington. And I was a little intimidated as I walked uh, through the mountains there. And so to define verse number nine and understand God's perspective in saying that Nimrod was a mighty hunter, I'm not sure what the, what the status of his uh, uh, collection would be as far as how many animals he was able to take uh, to provide food for his family. But God made a note here that he was a mighty hunter, and I know he had lots of skill that many others would not possess at this time. And the Bible goes on to say in verse number 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And so this man, Nimrod here, he had great stature in this community. Um, I believe that he was a, a, a leader to say the least. And the beginning of his kingdom was this place called Babel. The Bible goes on to say also uh, Erech and Achad and Kaunek in the land of Shinar. And so he was a leader, wasn't he? Um, and you guys have heard of Babel, right? Remember the Tower of Babel? We're going to get into this in the next chapter in Genesis chapter 11 because that's where we're going to see this story of the Tower of Babel. And this man Nimrod that we're reading about here in verse number 9, this son of uh, Cush, if you will, um, he is uh, one that... Uh, was a big part of the Tower of Babel and trying to create this construction. And boy, we're going to build something up here. And uh, the Bible says at this particular time that everybody was of the same language. But Nimrod was a great leader at this time. And we're going to see this story of Nimrod unfold as we look into uh, this next chapter. Verse number 11 of Genesis chapter number 10, out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, and that city Raboth and Kala. Now we've heard of Nineveh, right? And we wonder where did Nineveh come from? Well, the Bible here right here is telling us um, that uh, uh, they went forth out of Asher and, and builded this city Nineveh. Verse number 12, and Resin between Nineveh and Kala, uh, the same is a great city. And so we're seeing the establishment of some of these cities that we hear about in the Bible as these men and their families and God's creation came off of the ark uh, back in Genesis chapter number 9. And uh, God said to go out and, and be fruitful and multiply. And uh, we did just that. Or the Bible says that the folks did just that. Now keep in mind, the first uh, several chapters here as we get through um, even uh, chapter number 12, remember the time frame that is represented from Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter number 12. It's some 2,000 years in time. And really, if you consider our study in the, this entire book right here, boy, when we finish up these next couple chapters, we'll literally be about a third of the way through the biblical timeline in the Bible. We won't be a third of the way through the Bible. <laughs> But we'll be a third of the way through the biblical timeline. So just understand, these first several chapters of the book of Genesis, they cover a great deal of time. And so we consider, well, how, how would these cities be building and how would this multiply? There's a lot of time that um, is gone by in these first several chapters in the book of Genesis. And God's creation did go forth and they did uh, multiply and they were fruitful. And uh, the people resided under some of these great and mighty men that are being described um, here in these verses before us. Verse number 13 of Genesis chapter number 10, and Mizraim begat Ludium and Animium and Lebium and Naphthium. And uh, we look at verse number 14, and Parthrasim and Caslehim, one of whom came Philistine. And uh, 
Caphthora. Man, this is painful to listen to me mention all these names right here, but I think it's important for us to be able to go through it. Verse 15, And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And we consider even the land of Canaan and, and the descendants uh, uh, thereof. Verse number 16 says, And the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite. We've heard those, right? We've heard those names in the Bible, and we're going to hear more about them. Um, verse number 17 says, And the Hivite, and the Erkite, and the Sinite. Um, these are all people groups that are mentioned in the Bible as we go through, and we see all this different activity that's taking place in the Bible. Uh, a lot of the activity that we're going to see taking place as we continue and make this journey through the book of Genesis, boy, there's a lot of battles that take place, aren't there? There's a lot of wars that take place. There's a lot of bloodshed uh, that ends up happening. Some of it God-ordained and some of it not God-ordained. But think about this. These are the offspring of Noah and his sons. And these were a godly group of people. You remember as God considered the earth and he looked down upon his creation, he said, man, the... Imagination and the thoughts of the heart of mankind are evil continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, didn't he? And him and his families entered into the ark. Now, we didn't read through the, the last part of uh, chapter number 9. But you know, I'll, I'll say this. Read this on your own. The last part of Genesis chapter number 9, it really shows the frailty of mankind. It shows the human, uh, humanality of this man named Noah. Um, he was a, a man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Um, he uh, was uh, given the great privilege of entering into the ark as he trusted in God and his sons as well and their wives. But in Genesis chapter number 9, there's a record that shows here that Noah drank um, alcohol in excess and became drunk. You guys read that on your own, and you know what? Shows you that he's a sinner just like everybody else, isn't he? Even though he may have found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and, and so did we as God allowed us uh, and wooed us to him and brought us to that place where we bent our knee to Jesus Christ, we're low down, no good, born again, heathen too, aren't we? Susceptible to sinful behavior. The Bible tells us that we ought to be sober and be vigilant for our adversary, uh, the devil, uh, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And we consider God trying to uh, establish within the heart and mind of mankind the thought that they need to be clear thinking individuals in order to serve God in the capacity that he wants them to. Amen? Now, <clears throat> people partake of alcohol. That doesn't mean that everybody that partakes of alcohol is going to run out and murder their neighbor. Okay? But it does cause the mind to start thinking differently. And as you further consume alcohol, uh, the brain continues to think differently and differently and differently. And of, of course, the uh, normal restraint that a human being would have uh, in their life through the Holy Spirit really starts to be lifted, right? And that's why we can see people acting a little bit goofy, doing things outside of their normal character, because you know what? There's a great influence that's there. And we see at the end of Genesis chapter 9 that, that Noah gets to that place where he does, he consumes uh, alcohol to the place where the Bible says that he has become drunken. But you know what? Once again, I'll say this. He's a sinner saved by grace. Amen. And I'm so very thankful to be able to see that God can put some simple things in the Word of God showing that Noah was not a perfect man. Amen. He was a, he was a normal man just like you and I are. But we consider the generations of Noah, um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, his sons, as they come. And I would uh, once again encourage you to use these uh, sh charts that I've given you uh, to do a little bit of study on your own. Um, something that I've done in the past that has been enjoyable for me and helped me to kind of understand um, something and, and learn something from genealogy. I put this to a particular genealogy chart before you um, without any ages of any of these people, as far as how old they were. 
That's a great thing to document on your particular chart as you study on your own. Right next to the names of these people, God tells us when they died, how many years they lived. Um, it's a good study just to chicken scratch down how old they were when they died um, on your sheet here. And that will help draw you in a little bit to this genealogy that God is putting before us. Um, you know, some people would say reading genealogy is pretty boring. And it could be. <laughs> And it is if we don't put something on it, right? Because we can read these things and boy, it's just a bunch of name after name after name. And after a while, it just becomes a bunch of names. And man, this is just a lot. And that's why I want to help us to kind of get it a little bit by um, putting some of these charts before us so that you can see um, how this stuff really pans out in the family tree that's here. And we're going to look further, uh, further at this as we uh, get into the book of Genesis further and we get to Father Abraham. Um, we'll take a look at that genealogy as it it goes from Abraham, and it can, continues uh, to go through our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. There's some importance uh, that's here and some things that uh, uh, we can definitely learn from this. Verse number 19 of Genesis chapter number 10. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, um, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza. Now, you guys have heard of that. I said Gaza, Gaza, uh, Gaza Strip. You guys, we've heard a lot about that going on here recently over the last five or six weeks, haven't we? Uh, Gaza has been a hotbed uh, of uh, activity. Um, the remainder of verse number 19 says, As thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah. Boy, we've heard those before too, haven't we? These are a couple of other cities that came about during this time. Um, and Abdma and Zeboim and Elisha. And so these are some places, and you know, you can study these out. I mentioned that uh, the people groups from uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the, the different regions of the world uh, that they kind of went to, and their people uh, were born, and their offspring continued to grow. Um, this is the time when the planet was divided. The earth was separated. And we're going to see uh, moreover as that happens in Genesis chapter number 11 when we uh, get to the building of Babel and that tower of Babel where God does put a fine line between a lot of these people groups with dividing their language and confounding them in that way and them uh, separating up into these different lands and uh, beginning to... Uh, populate the earth uh, with their offspring. But it can be completely lined up with Scripture if you chose to sit down and you chose to study these different cities that we've already mentioned to see where they land geographically on our planet. Um, you're going to see that they line up with our, our charts here that we have passed out. Verse number 21 of Genesis chapter number 10, unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. And, uh, you know, we look and we consider uh, the way that God uh, divides up the uh, genealogy here. As we look through the Bible, God will typically point out the genealogy of the failed bloodline first. He'll show us those ones that uh, failed uh, to do their part, if you will, and how their bloodline was uh, cut off. Now, we consider Cain and Abel, and we consider what went on in, in that day when uh, blood was shed and uh, one brother kills another brother, and uh, we can see that the bloodline, we've talked about this in our, in our previous study, on how that bloodline of that sinful behavior was not the bloodline that Jesus Christ would come from, was it? In fact, uh, God brought another soul into this uh, planet at that time to replace uh, that evil one that slew his brother and that uh, to keep that bloodline going. Verse number 22, once again, um, I'm sorry, verse number 23, these are the children of Shem. Um, and uh, verse number 23 says, And the children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash, um, and Aphrixad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber, and Eber was born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. And when the Bible says, in his day... That means that he lived in this time when these languages will be confounded and the planet will be literally divided up in a way that has never been done before. Uh, 
Their languages will be confounded. They'll be spread about uh, about this planet um, and they will not be communicating with each other as they had previously done. These men, as the Bible is giving us these, uh, the genealogy here, um, they will uh, will be upon this planet or they were upon the planet um, during this time when the earth was divided. Verse number 30 of Genesis chapter number 10. And their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. Now we consider the whole chapter number 10 and the genealogy of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we finish up with verse number 32 where it says, These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. This is where everybody has come from. And so I would encourage you to try and get your mind around this genealogy a little bit more as we go into this next week. Use these charts as you endeavor to get into your own private study time. Figure out some things that you can notate on your charts that would help you to get further engaged and understand what God is doing through His bloodline that leads all the way to Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting to see how families, the way that they live, impact generations to come in their bloodline. I was so very thankful. I have never had my blood drawn. I know that my grandfather was from Poland. That's about all I know. But I know this. God broke the chain of sin in my family bloodline when He called me to His Son, Jesus Christ. And I look at my Five children that have been born in my family. God has brought each one of them to that place where they've trusted Christ as their Savior when they were very young. And He broke that chain of that bloodline living to themselves. And I'm so very thankful. My mom even listening this morning and and many others of our family. Boy, they've, they've chose to turn to Christ. And that's awesome to see on how God can interrupt even an ungodly bloodline through His grace and His mercy as He extends it to us. Consider these things as you study this next week in these genealogies. Don't don't continue to have the same thought process that genealogies are dry and boring. Uh, They're not. They're a little exciting, especially God's genealogy. Let's pray. Father, we love You so very much. We thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for the detail in which You uh, put Your Word before us to try and help us to understand these things that have taken place in times past. We pray that You'd help us, Lord, to further understand them as we read this week and as we spend our private time with You. Bless as we continue to worship You this morning, Lord, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you back in here in about 10 minutes for our morning service.